Oh, in the last video, uh, I was pretty rushed on calculating, finding the inductance of this, uh, in this large inductor out of a Prius, and uh, that's because I was running out of uh, storage space there on the, uh, on the phone. Um, it only lets me record about 30 minutes before it uh, will just stop recording because we hit the uh, Android file size limit. Maybe one of these days I'll get a dedicated video recorder instead of using my cell phone, but it uh, hasn't happened yet. But anyways, I'm going to actually spend some time showing this because it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, so here, I'll go and change this. But So we've got the function generator here, and you know, we just... You can put it at whatever frequency you want. And you're just going to hook the scope probe directly across the output, like I've got here. And then we're going to hook up a couple clip leads, like so. And we're not going to hook them up to anything, but uh, we'll leave this like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook them up to the inductor now. And you shouldn't see it change too much. Kind of shifted it, but so maybe a little bit of attenuation. But uh, you want to go ahead and adjust the function generator until you get half the voltage. So right now we are putting out, I got it set 5 volts division, so we're doing 20 volts, or yeah, 20 volts peak to peak, so 10 volts above zero, negative 10 there. And what we're going to do is turn the frequency down until we reach uh, plus and minus. 5 volts or 10 volts peak to peak. So you want exactly 50%. And what that does is it sets the this the function generator as a 50 ohm impedance. And by adjusting the frequency, we eventually get the impedance of the inductor to be the same. And once you have both of them being about the same, that allows you to do a little bit of math on there, some good math, and that will allow you to figure out the inductance within reason. I mean, we don't know if this 50 ohm resistor is exactly 50 ohms, but it's going to be close. We just want to get in the ballpark. Um, so you end up with, um, I think, what did I do last time? It was about 12.3. And so if I turn this down to 12.3 ish, you can see that's about, uh, and then I'm going to unplug. So all I'm going to do is just unplug the inductor and tap it and you'll see it's going from 10 volts peak to peak or 20 volts peak to peak 10 volts peak to peak right and given the frequency of 13.3 you plug it into that equation down here l equals 1 over the square root of uh, one third uh, one third of <laughs> l equals the square root of one third times r over two pi f, and r is the resistance of the function generator, which is at 50 ohms. And if you reduce this all out, you get 4.57 divided by f. And if you pump this 12.3 kilohertz, you get L in henrys, and then you multiply by a million to get microhenrys, and it with uh, 371 microhenrys, which, given the size of this. I'd believe it. I mean, we're not expecting it to be a very large value. I mean, it, technically this is kind of big, but it's not It's not out of the realm of possibility for an inductor this big. I mean, you can kind of, you can see the uh, the size of the coils in it, so. It's a, it's a pretty big inductor, physically, for current, but its actual inductance is not really that high. So, with that information, we can calculate out how much energy is stored per cycle, and we can figure out what those other components need to be. So let's see, got that going on. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is um, for uh, display purposes, I was thinking you can, with Wi Fi on the, um, the old DMOC adapter, we could use the tablet to display everything. But I've actually got a whole bunch of displays in my box of displays. And you know, you could get away with one of these little, you know, dot matrix displays, but that wouldn't be really cool, would it? You know, I could easily just pick up every once in a while. A little bit bigger, but you know, you want to be able to see it. You want some kind of impact. LCD ones are kind of hard to, to see. And I've got some other ones down in here. Some different uh, kinds of displays. Over here. 
Like the, here's a nice little graphics display. It's pretty big, but eh. We want something like this. Go ahead and pull this puppy up. There's an old uh, VFD display. Yeah. It's nice, big. I think that'll look really cool. And it's a um, it's a graphics display and a character display, but you know you could have a big, you know, voltage, current, you know, be really cool looking. Um, so I'm thinking I'm gonna enlist. Uh, I'm gonna use this uh, old, this old VFD display. I've actually, if you go look on my website, there's actually a um, I've got a video of it running. I wrote a uh, some code back in uh, Intel Assembly that uh, that actually drove this. Actually, I could probably pull it up on the tablet here. It's kind of a cool. But um, it's a nice uh, display for doing stuff. It's very bright. It's got a nice green to it. Um, I'm going to keep talking here while I try to go to my website. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little display. It does both characters and graphics. The cool thing about it is it has multiple pages. And so uh, you can actually be writing to one page of memory while it's displaying one so that you can do uh, really good smooth animations because you just flip a bit and it changes the uh, the um, uh, uh, page so yeah you could you write to one in the background then you bring it to the front and then write to the next one bring it to the front so you're able to do that just kind of cool um, where is it at on my website oh here we go Uh -huh. Here you go. Here's a really old. That's that display working. 2002 is when I last did it, so that's pretty cool. And then here it says displaying uh, text. So it's got a bunch of. How many lines is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's like eight eight lines by probably. 32 or 64 characters, probably 32. 32 by 8. But uh, yeah, picked that up a long time ago. So it'd be nice to actually use it for something. That'll be cool. Um, so yeah, uh, do that standalone. Probably gonna implement uh, the controls uh, via encoders so you could set the voltage so you wouldn't have to hook a laptop or a tablet or anything up to it. You could just, uh, you know, move an encoder around and things like that. And that would work fine for all the uh, input. That way, if you did have a laptop hooked up, you know, if you use POTS, then the POT has a, a fixed value that it's record reporting, and then you're going to be kind of overriding that with, you know, signals from a different device if you control it or do logging or something like that. So it's just easier to use the encoders because then if they're incremental, you just, as you turn it, it changes the value, but you can go and say, use your tablet, move a slider, change that same value, and then they won't interfere with each other. Plus the Micro has built-in quadrature decode engines. That little DSPIC 33E series that's on the, on the, on the uh, DMC adapter actually does have a lot of cool stuff on there. This little Micro has pretty much everything you could ever want for. The, the coolest thing on it is the peripheral pin select, like the, these pins you can make them anything you want. They can be SPI ports, I squared Z, PWM, uh, UARTs, uh, you, you name it, CAN bus, whatever you want to map over there, you can map anything to anything. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's pretty useful for layout. You just random, you just uh, find the quickest way to get to the to any of the pins, and then come back later and say, okay, I want to make that pin and those two pins a UART transmit and receive. So that's pretty easy to do. <coughs> So that's cool. Um, let's see what else do we got here? Um, yeah, well, you know, I've got. Let me pause it for a second. We do. We can do a fun thing with the inductor. Um, kind of demonstrate this principle of taking this lower voltage to a higher voltage using uh, a light bulb in my battery pack. So give me one second, and I'll go set that up. So. Okay. Welcome back. This is um, fun with high voltage. So I've got my uh, battery pack here set up for, it looks like 156 volts. We're coming over here 
to the inductor. So we've got one side hooked up here. We're going through my um, load bank here, which is a bunch of light bulbs. I have everybody unscrewed except for this guy. He's screwed in. So we only got 100 watt by 100 watt light bulb, 156 volts. I got this big inductor hooked up and a couple pieces of copper, just a um, bare copper wire, and we're gonna make some sparks. So. So what's happening here is the um, when I go like this, the light comes on, and that's going to pull about an amp through this in this uh, inductor here, and then when I release, the voltage is going to jump up to whatever it takes to ionize the atmosphere to keep that this the current in the inductor wants to keep flowing. And so the voltage will go up as high as possible to try to complete that circuit. And so the sound that it makes, if you can hear it, I'll put it next to the... It's actually turning on and off very rapidly. And what's happening is, as the, um, as the uh, atmosphere breaks down, it ionizes and becomes conductive. Current flows through the inductor and it rebuilds its magnetic field, and then uh, the voltage starts dropping, and then so the, it essentially breaks the connection again, so the voltage goes back up until it, makes, it can ionize the atmosphere. So if I had a slow motion camera, you would actually see it doing that multiple times a second, like a whole bunch, and that's what makes that noise. Cool, huh? But you can see how far it's jumping, that gap. And that's what happens with <laughs> an inductor. It's trying to keep that alive. And we're going to use that exact same principle for this. So when you've stored the energy in here, when we open it up, this energy is going to get released, so the voltage here is going to start ramping up. And that's how you store energy in these inductors. If I put if I put on more of these light bulbs, it should get we should be able to make the spark go even farther. I don't remember, some of these might be burnt out. And now I've got two of them. I've only got so yeah, this metal bulb is not is not working. So let me get that on the scope here. You can or on the screen. You can see I've got these two going and when I run this now I can now get much farther right so now we're up to two amps Throwing a spark about half an inch, centimeter or so. There you go. Fun with inductors, huh? <laughs> Fun with big inductors. This this wouldn't be hot at all. I mean, it's like ice cold. This is like no nothing. It's only a couple amps. But um, imagine if there were 250 amps flowing through there. How big of a spark do you think you could generate? That'd be pretty cool, huh? Anyways, I think that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.